Glimmer of Dragons, a novella from the Other Realm, by Heather G. Harris. Chapter One I'm going to kill you! Mrs. Sanderson screamed at her husband. I felt relieved as my internal radar pinged. Lie. Thank goodness I wasn't about to witness a murder. I'd stared into the underbelly of human existence a few times, but I hadn't witnessed a murder yet. The aftermath, but not the action itself. I had so few, I have nevers, left. I couldn't help but feel a little responsible for this particular pickle. Sure, Mr. Sanderson had brought it on himself by the whole cheating thing, but as Mrs. Sanderson's private investigator, I was the one who had dug it all up, and taken photos, and videos, and sent them to my client. Truthfully, all I'd gotten was some evidence of some hot and heavy petting. For plenty of clients, that was enough. Foreplay still ticked the cheating box. With hindsight, I should have waited until the promiscuous couple had gone somewhere private to get it on before I sent the email. How was I to know they were Mr. and Mrs. Sanderson's special spot? I didn't think my cuckolded client would recognize the place, let alone turn up for a smackdown. Honestly, I think at least half Mrs. Sanderson's rage was due to the fact he'd taken his secretary for a romantic picnic at their special place. The other half of the rage was due solely to the cheating thing. Mrs. Sanderson might not have been willing to kill, but I winced a little as she smashed her fist into the face of her erstwhile husband. She was currently giving him a piece of her mind. And her fist. I don't generally encourage violence, even though I'm proficient in it, but it was hard to feel that Mrs. Sanderson was in the wrong. Her tirade was in full flow. She'd given him the best years of her life and he was schlepping the secretary. An affair was bad enough, but he hadn't even had the decency to be discreet. I'd been on the job for all of half a day, and besides, doing the secretary was just an embarrassing cliché. I've found that most cheating spouses react in a number of set ways when confronted. One is the pleader, who begs his wife to forgive him and explains that hussy number one means nothing to him. Two is the man excuse. He does really love you, but he has needs. Three is the worst. Three is the sneerer. What did you expect when you've let yourself go? I hate threes. I was honestly a bit relieved that Mr. Sanderson was a pleader. His beautiful secretary, the aforementioned hussy number one in this scenario, was watching him with her luscious lips wide open, eyes batting in disbelief as he told his wife that nothing had really happened, lie, and that he loved her dearly. True. Hussy's eyes narrowed and her hands rose to her hips. Hussy number one wasn't taking this lying down. I was warming to her. Have the decency not to lie, George, she said, glaring at him. We've been sleeping together for six months. You told me you were in the midst of a divorce. I would never, ever have considered dating you if I'd known you were still together. True. Mrs. Sanderson's rage was wholly focused on her husband. She waved not so Hussey's explanation away. I don't blame you. You weren't to know better. You didn't put a ring on my finger and swear to be loyal to me for better or for worse. All true. Poor Mrs. Sanderson. Her voice rose louder and louder. Mr. Sanderson was looking forlorn and desperate. His left eye was already puffing up nicely. Mrs. Sanderson had scored a direct hit. On days like today, my job didn't seem very highbrow. Ultimately, whether Mrs. Sanderson chose to forgive her husband was up to her. They would either forge a stronger relationship, or their relationship would shatter forever. I'd learned to accept that, either way. It wasn't my fault. I was just a torch, shining the light on the relationship. Mr. Sanderson had broken it. I was confident Mrs. Sanderson would find someone else pretty quickly. I hadn't known her long, but she struck me as kind and loving. I have a sixth sense about people, my gut instinct, and it is never wrong. My internal radar is easy to understand. It tells me if you are telling the truth or a lie. My gut instinct is harder to quantify, but I've learned not to ignore it. Someone had rung the police at some point during Mrs. Sanderson's explosive takedown. This was a nice area, and in the heat of summer it was packed with picnickers. No one was concerned enough to intervene directly, but... Calling the police was easily done. The cops must have been in the vicinity already, as it took them no time to arrive. My old school friend, Detective Steve Marley, 
was making his way over with another detective I didn't know. Steve is tall and thin, with prematurely greying hair. He's a good person. I've had a good working relationship with him, particularly over the last year or two as I've testified in a couple of his cases. I met his eyes as he approached and gave him a friendly nod. He quirked a questioning eyebrow in response. A fair, I mouthed. He gave a nod and turned to the troubled couple. I sat on my picnic blanket and watched as Steve did his thing, talking them down. When the situation had calmed, his colleague took out a pad of paper and started making notes. Paper? How old school? Steve turned back to me. Sunbathing? he asked. Working, I admitted. You kick this off. Inadvertently. I stood up and moved a little closer so we had more privacy. It's been a while. Have you managed to look into their case again? Steve looked down and away. Sorry, Jinx, but you know as well as I do that your parents' case is cold. It's been five years. But there could be similar crimes. It's still worth digging into now and again, I argued. He shook his head. I'm sorry, Jinx. There hasn't been anything like it. He hesitated. The ferocity of your parents' deaths, it's notable. If there'd been another home invasion like theirs, it would ping on my feelers, but... He shook his head. I'm sorry, he repeated, shifting awkwardly. I shrugged like it wasn't a big deal and forced a smile. No problem. Thanks anyway. I said it lightly, but I turned away, so we couldn't see the tears suddenly burning in my eyes. This was my cue to leave. I packed up my picnic blanket, book, and drink, and whistled my dog, who was still stretched out contentedly in the sun. He's an ebony Great Dane, and he adores the warmth. He basks in it, like a cat. At my whistle, he opened one eye. Time to go, Gatto, I told him firmly. He yawned and reluctantly heaved himself up, doing a stretch that made me realize where the downward-facing dog yoga pose had come from. I clicked on his lead. I shot Steve another smile for good measure, which he returned awkwardly. I didn't make eye contact with Mrs. Sanderson. Now wasn't the time to present her with my bill. My work here was done, and a strategic exit was in order before Mr. Sanderson questioned my involvement in the whole mess. I'd learned over the last year or two that furious ex-spouses made some really, really rubbish stalkers. So, Gatto and I exited stage left and meandered slowly down the appropriately named Long Mile. There were a lot of people out and about in the sun, and the scent of sun cream was heavy in the air. It reminded me nostalgically of holidays by the sea. A burst of laughter to my left drew my gaze. It was a family of three. The parents were older than me, late thirties, I'd guess, and their daughters must have been nearing ten. They were all smiling. In that moment, they were happy. Grief welled up and kicked me. It always catches you when you aren't expecting it. I'd give anything to go back in time and have another moment like that with my parents. To relish it. To savour their laughter and love. I realised I was staring and looked away. Awkwardly. Tears were sitting in my eyes again, which, frankly, pissed me off. My parents had been gone five years. How did I still have any tears left? Gatto nudged my hand with his great head and gave a bark. He gambled around my feet, jumping up and down. He knew I was sad, and he was trying to make me smile. It worked. He is the best dog in the world, so how could I not smile at him? I swallowed past the golf ball in my throat and stroked him. You're the best, I told him. He gave a firm woof and wagged his tail in affirmation. He knows he's awesome. He was still jumping about, acting like a six-month-old pup. He leapt up and gave me a slobbering lick across my forehead. For a moment, the sky flashed lilac. I blinked, and the sky cleared back to its normal blue. What the hell? I murmured, frowning. I rubbed my eyes. Still blue, but I could have sworn that the sky was purple for a moment. Freaking purple. I've heard of people smelling odd scents, and that being a precursor to a stroke— and I wondered if seeing changing colours meant I had a brain tumour. Something to Google later, I guessed. I always have the best evenings planned. Dinner for one, and a little bit of medical self-diagnosis. Rock and roll. Another dog started towards us, and I tensed automatically. 
I knew what was coming. The dog, a bulldog, was happily trotting forwards to greet Gatto. When he was about three metres away, he stopped and froze. He let out a baleful whine, turned tail and ran all the way back to his owner. As he looked back at Gatto, the whites of his eyes were showing. I stroked Gatto's back. He just doesn't like big dogs, I offered. Gatto looked at me with an expression that I termed his yeah right look. Can dogs be sarcastic? I shrugged. Whatever, I said to Gatto. We don't need friends. We've got each other. We're our own pack. Gatto gave an affirmative bark and pranced forward like a horse doing dressage. Other dogs don't like Gatto. Not a single one. Sometimes I feel like my baby is being bullied by the other kids at school, and it's heartbreaking, but there's really nothing I can do. I've tried puppy training classes, but no matter how good the treat, other dogs won't go near my pup. We're two outcasts together, so that means neither of us is alone. I gave a little glare to the chicken bulldog and whistled Gatto. This way, I called. We were nearly out of the long mile. We were in Windsor, one of my favourite towns in the world. It has kitsch down to a T, and there's always something a bit thrilling about watching the changing of the guard around the castle. I had come here as a child with my parents, and now I came here to reminisce about them, and catch adulterers, of course. I remembered our own family picnics here. I'd nearly caused quite a scene when a little girl from another family claimed her brother had eaten her ice cream. I'd known right away she was lying, and I wanted to march right over and tell her parents just that— But as always, my parents counselled me to hold my tongue, not to cause a fuss, to stay off the radar. I appreciate the discretion my parents had forced on me. If my skills had become common knowledge, I expect I'd now be an MI5 consultant whether I wanted to be one or not. Or maybe I would have been dissected in the name of science. Sometimes I think that using my gift to track down cheating spouses isn't quite the mission in life that I envisaged at age eight but I guess we can't all be firefighting space queens. We reached my destination, Limes of Windsor, the top cafe in the area, as a stone's throw away from Windsor Castle. Gatto sat outside whilst I popped in for my usual latte. I grabbed a sausage sandwich to go and ordered a couple of extra sausages for Gatto. I also ordered a fancy slice of chocolate cake, which was packed in a swanky takeout box. As soon as I stepped out of the cafe, Gatto's nose started to twitch, I laughed a little. Okay, here you go, pup. I handed him a sausage, and he wolfed it in one. At least chew it and act like it was nice, I complained. Gatto gave me an unrepentant grin, tongue lolling. I know a lot of people think their fur baby is special, but my dog actually is. I swear he listens to me 90% of the time. The remaining 10% is willful disobedience. My mobile rang. Sharp security services... I answered in my best phone voice. Jinx, a familiar voice responded. Oh, thank goodness, I have need of your unique services, darling. It's time-sensitive. Lord Wilfred Samuel frequently gambles away his family heirlooms, and on a grand scale. The next day, with a hangover battering his brain into some semblance of sense, he regrets his poor life choices. That's where I come in. I'm a security expert, a P.I., and occasionally an object retriever. Initially, I quoted Lord Samuel an exorbitant sum to retrieve an heirloom, and had expected that to be the end of it. He hadn't batted an eyelid and had agreed to my outrageous fees. Wilf's gambling habits saved my fledgling business. Let's meet, Lord Samuel entreated. Rosie's, do you know it? His question had a casual air to it. Too casual. I knew of Rosie's Café, but I didn't think it was anything special. I know it. I was stretching the truth a little because I hadn't been inside, but I don't like admitting to things I don't know. I knew where it was, and that was all that was important. Do you? He asked musingly. Good. Let's meet at 4pm. I have a few things to verify first. It was 2pm now, so that would give me time to whiz home and grab a shower. I'd leave Gatto at home, too. I couldn't remember if Rosie's was a dog-friendly establishment, and I wasn't going to leave him out in the sun if I was going to be long. With Lord Samuel, the meetings were often long. He was eccentric, flirtatious, and enjoyed the sound of his own voice. 
despite myself, I liked him. Okay, four is fine. See you soon. I rang off and picked up the pace, shoving down the remainder of my sandwich as I went. Our car was at a car park that charged steep fees. Today, they were being billed to Mrs. Sanderson, so I didn't worry too much about them. I beeped the car to unlock it and open the door. As a waft of heat rolled out, Gatto looked at me reproachfully. He likes the warmth, but not a roasting oven. I opened all the doors to encourage a through breeze. I caught sight of myself in the window's reflection and winced. My dark hair was frizzy and untidy. Humidity is not my friend. Gone were the gentle waves I'd carefully styled it in before I'd left the house. I tugged a hairband off my wrist and pushed it up into a bun that looked better and was substantially cooler on my neck. My makeup had melted, and the eyeliner around my blue eyes had smudged a good way down my pale skin. Yikes, I was a fright. It was a good thing I had time for a shower. I started the engine and whacked on the aircon full blast. Gatto and I roared off, tunes blaring, and got home in short order. Home is a semi-detached three-bedroom house in Beaconsfield, Buckinghamshire. It's a decent size, in a good neighbourhood, and if I'd had to pay for it myself, there's no way 23-year-old me could have afforded it. Thanks to the untimely murder of my parents, I didn't have to. I inherited the house, along with a fair chunk of money that I had no idea what to do with. I parked up and let Gatto out of the car. He peed on the front lawn by his favourite bush and gave a friendly bark to our neighbour, Mrs. Harding. Today, Mrs. Harding, who is affectionately known as Mrs. H, was sporting a blue pastel suit and a coiffured bob. She's the best-dressed homemaker I've ever seen. She dresses in a different power suit every day, nails to match. Her appearance is always immaculate. I've known Mrs. H my whole life. She taught me to plait my hair, and she painted my nails on more than one occasion. Her daughter, Jane, is older than me, and I suspect Mrs. H missed looking after a little girl. Mrs. H's husband, Sam, had died a few years before my parents. We both know a fair bit about grief, and she's been a real rock over the last few years. She was delighted when I got Gatto last year, and she helps look after him whenever I'm out on business. Hey, Mrs. H, I called. I grabbed you something from Limes of Windsor. She beamed. Oh, thank you, Jinx. That's so kind of you. I passed her the cape box, and she peered in with evident delight. She never takes payment for helping me with Gatto, so I do my best to show my appreciation in weird and wacky ways. Cake was pretty dull for me, but I knew she'd love it. My favourite gift for her had been a track day. To my surprise, the prim and pristine Mrs. H had a ball on the driving circuit, and she's even gone back since of her own accord. I had accidentally uncovered her inner speed demon. It reminded me that there was often far more to a person than meets the eye. I showered hastily and didn't bother drying my hair. The heat would do it in no time, and I couldn't face the idea of turning on the hairdryer. I spritzed on my favourite perfume, Chanel's Chance. It was the first perfume my mum had bought me, and its scent always reminds me of her. Today, it made me smile. Some days, it makes me cry. I reapplied my makeup and patted on some fixing powder. I dressed in my standard uniform for client meetings, grey suit pants and a white shirt. It was too hot for the matching suit jacket. I shoved my hair into a bun and considered myself good to go. I called goodbye to Gatto, who was lying in the sun again, and motored off to Rosie's. Time to find out what kind of nefarious deed Wilf wanted me to do this time. Chapter 2 Rosie's is a small cafe with limited parking at the end of a small row of shops, including a co-op, a Chinese takeout, a dry cleaner, and a funeral director. Everything a community needs. I parked on the road right outside. I had a debit card in my pocket, so I left my bulky handbag hidden under the passenger seat. I locked up the car and peered in through the cafe window. It was surprisingly busy. I wasn't sure it was the place I'd have chosen to discuss an object retrieval, but Wilf was the boss. I keep my voice low and make sure not to say anything incriminating. As I entered, a little bell dinged above the door. There was a queue at the counter, but the barista still took the time to give me a welcoming smile. There was an assurance about his smile that made me think that he was the owner, rather than just an employee. He was tall, 
nearly six feet five inches, with bright red hair and a smattering of freckles. He was surprisingly muscular for a cafe owner, if, indeed, he was the owner. My gut instinct said he was, and, like I said, I've learned to listen to my gut over the years. There's something more to my mysterious skill set than truth and lies, but I'm damned if I know what it is. I spotted Wilf, sitting in a small booth on the left side of the cafe. Today he was dressed in a ridiculous three-piece suit, which was at odds with the place and the heat. He had a bright purple handkerchief spilling out of his top pocket. Its psychedelic design of overlaid black triangles made my eyes hurt a little, so I averted my gaze from it. Wilf's booth was as far from the queue as possible. At least he was showing some discretion. I frowned as I watched a customer open a door beside the counter, presumably to go into a back room. I waited for the owner to reprimand him, but instead, he watched silently. Almost immediately, the errant shopper emerged from the back room and shut the door. He had nothing in his hands, so he hadn't gone into a storeroom. Maybe he thought it was a toilet, but it wasn't. Weird. I shook it off and turned back to Wilf. He was looking at the owner, and I followed his gaze just in time to see him give Wilf a head shake. I was missing something here, and I didn't like it. There was something going on at Rosie's, and I hated not knowing what. My internal radar means I often feel like I'm the one in the know, so I dislike intensely being in the dark. I slid into the booth on the opposite side. Lord Samuel, I greeted him. It was guaranteed to get a rise. Wilf, please, Jinx. Call me Wilf. After all you've done for me, we're certainly friends, aren't we? I avoided answering that. You're my client, Wilf. He smiled when I used his name. We're more than that, he bickered lightly. Wilf is an older gentleman, in his fifties at least. He's handsome, in an older guy way. The table in our booth was overflowing with drinks, all of which appeared to be fresh and not half-drunk leftovers from previous occupants. I gestured at the table. What gives? Wilf grinned. I wasn't sure what you'd like, so I got you everything. Everything? I repeated incredulously. Everything on the menu. Everything in the shop would have been ridiculous. Sure, that would have been ridiculous. I shook my head. Save me from millionaires with more money than sense. It hadn't occurred to him to let me order my own damn drink. I picked out what I hoped was a chai latte with something sprinkled on the top and took a sip. It was tepid, and it was cappuccino. I touched a couple of the other drinks. They were all a little cool. Lukewarm coffee is not my thing. I like my drink scalding. The owner caught my grimace and came over. Is there a drink that's your favourite? He asked. Chai latte? I said hopefully. A chai latte wouldn't be so bad if it were cool. The ginger gave me a friendly smile. He leaned over and picked up a tall white mug, sprinkled with spices. This one. For a second, I thought the mug glowed red, but I blinked and the moment passed. Something was really wrong with my eyes or my brain. I was definitely googling later. The owner held the tall mug out to me. I went to take it but quickly withdrew my hand. Yowzers, that's hot. Sorry, he apologised. I'll just set it down for you. He put it on the table in front of me. How the heck he was holding that scalding mug was beyond me. Maybe you got used to it working in a cafe. Shall I clear the rest? He asked Wilf. Yes, please, Roscoe. Wilf nodded. Roscoe grabbed a tray and started loading it up. He carted away three full tray loads until our table was empty, bar our two remaining drinks. What a ridiculous waste of everyone's time and effort. I blew a little on my chai latte and took a cautious sip. It was still incredibly hot, just how I liked it. How strange that the one drink I wanted happened to be the hottest one. It must have been the last one Roscoe had made. Now that we were alone, I nodded to Wilf. Let's cut to the chase. What do you need? He sighed dramatically. Business, business, business. It's always business with you, Jinx. You're young, in the prime of your life. You're what, twenty-five? You need to relax. Have fun. I snorted. I am twenty-three, but I wasn't going to correct him. Sometimes clients think I'm too young to do my job. You have enough fun for the both of us, I quipped. Will flashed me a grin and didn't deny it. He fished his phone out of his pocket and unlocked it. He swiped through his photos until he came upon the one he wanted to show me. 
this, he said simply. It was a picture of an antique vase with two fishes in water on the front. The neck of the vase was painted a pale yellow and decorated with swirls and flourishes. It was nice, very nice, but I doubted I would consider it worth its price tag. How much is it worth? I asked curiously. I wasn't sure Wilf would answer. He smiled a little condescendingly. Millions. I swallowed. Plural. He nodded, his blue eyes flashing in amusement. Oh, yes, Jinx, lots of plural. I knew he was wealthy, but not so wealthy that he would chuck away something worth multiple millions just because it amused him. I sighed. And you use this as collateral in a bet because... He grinned again. No one in the poker game recognized it. No one. It's a Chinese vase, designed specifically for Emperor Xunlong in the late 18th century. It's virtually priceless. I won it in another game, actually, so it seemed only right to let it pass on. He grimaced. The one who won it is positively Philistine. He won't appreciate it. It'll just be one of many vases and jewels that mean nothing to him. That was all true, as far as Wilf believed it. That is the flaw with my skill. It only tells me the truth as someone believes it, not whether it is actually true or not. It's taken me some time to appreciate the distinction. What information have you got for me on the location? Wolf handed me a file. Examine it at home, he instructed. But the best part is there's no formal security system. I frowned. What kind of man in this day and age who has many priceless artifacts doesn't have a top-of-the-line system? He's a top-of-the-line vault, but the vase hasn't made its way in there yet. He's someone who believes in other deterrents. You're going to want to take your hound with you. I raised an eyebrow at that. Gatto is my number one asset, as well as being my four-legged best friend. He was about a year old when I got him, and I'd worried he wouldn't be very easy to train, but the reverse was true. He listens to every command I give him. He comes with me on a lot of my high-risk jobs, and he's proven his worth time and time again. He always has my back. Despite that, I don't advertise Gatto as part of the team. So how did Wilf know about him? My dog, why should I take him? I asked. Has the man got guard dogs? If so, that might make things hard if I had Gatto with me because other dogs don't like him. Not dogs, but something like them. Guard animals, Wilf said with a vague wave of his hand. Conrad's going to be out of the house tonight, but he will be in the grounds. The problem is that he's a hermit, almost agoraphobic. He's in a phase of his life where he hardly leaves the property. He loves to sit around and admire his wealth. I raise one eyebrow. And you know this how? Wilf waved away my question. We're friendly enough. Since he won't leave the house, he often hosts poker games at his residence. It's how I know the floor plan. Though, a word of caution. It is drawn from memory, so don't take it as a hundred percent. If he's a recluse, how can you be sure he'll be out of the house tonight? It's the summer solstice, and Conrad celebrates it every year. He'll leave the house at around 6pm, and he normally has a feast outside. Then he stays outside and watches the sunset. Once the sun has fallen and dark has come, he goes back inside. You'll have to get into the house whilst it's still daylight. Sunset tonight is at 9.21, so you need to be out of the house by then. You're giving me a very narrow window here, 6pm to 9.21pm. Why can't I go in the house later, when it's dark and he's sleeping? I'm not an habitual thief, but I much prefer less legal activities to take place during the witching hours. Wilf gave me a surprisingly serious look. Believe me, you want him out of the house. He considers himself part of the security, with good reason. You don't want to tangle with him. His treatment of intruders would be positively draconian. True. You seem to know a lot about him. It doesn't bother you to steal from a friend. It was an impertinent question, but although I thought Wilf was eccentric, I'd never tagged him for being completely immoral. He is more of an acquaintance than a friend. Wilf shrugged. And honestly, he's significantly wealthier than me. When you're as rich as us, money doesn't mean anything. It's the game that keeps us occupied. Conrad loves to accumulate treasures and riches. He calls them his hoard. But he does nothing with them. He just collects them for collecting's sake. At least I use my wealth to support my friends and family. True. Whatever justification you need. I wasn't there to pass judgment. My business is starting to pick up, and there will be a time when I can turn away the occasional retrieval job that Wilf pitches my way, but this wasn't it. 
The pay was just too damn good. I don't need to justify it. It's the right thing to do, Wilf sniffed. Possibly not gambling it away in the first place would have been the right thing to do, I pointed out. Wilf smiled, but where's the fun in that? Risk adds zest to your life. I gave him a flat look. He was adding zest to my life, not his own. He sobered. Conrad is a hermit, but he's not without his defences. You need to be careful. I can handle myself, I said firmly. My spiral into darkness at eighteen taught me all kinds of extra skills. I feel comfortable enough to defend myself with guns and knives. I'm not a karate master, but I have enough martial arts experience to feel confident. My parents have made me study mixed martial arts from a young age. They didn't want me ever to feel vulnerable when I was walking alone. Wilf smiled a little. If you were former special ops, I'd still say you couldn't handle him. True. I nodded slowly. This sounds like a dangerous job. Wilf nodded like he was pleased I was finally getting it. It is, but this is worth it. Triple your normal fee to get this vase back for me, but it has to be tonight. Triple? Holy hell. I already charged Wilf ridiculous fees. A triple fee payday was enough to cover all my business expenses for the next six months. Perhaps even a frugal year. I didn't bother to pretend to myself that I wasn't going to do the job. I justify it to my conscience later. Besides, I love the huge rush of adrenaline that follows a job like this. I'd be riding high for weeks. I had to find something to help fill the void. Now I'd stop skydiving. Anyway, if I didn't do the job, Wilf would hire someone else. Better than money in my pocket. Okay. Looked like I'd assuaged my conscience already. Wilf tapped the file he'd handed to me. Conrad's most expensive new acquisitions are displayed around the house for one week. After tonight, he will move the vase to his vault, and once it's in there, there's no getting it. I've marked where the vault is on the floor plan, but forget about it. You won't get in there. Wilf pulled out his phone, typed a quick message, and pressed send. My phone gave an answering buzz in my pocket. I've texted you the address. It's in Maidenhead, so won't take you long to get there. Well, that was handy. It was nearly 4.30pm. If I was going to break in somewhere tonight, I'd need some more prep time. In an ideal world, I'd have turned down this risky assignment, but I couldn't afford to turn down Wolf. Not for triple fees. I'll do it, I agreed. He smiled. Was it ever in doubt? Yes, I said firmly. Lie. Damn it, sometimes I hate my radar. Wolf smiled. He knew I was lying too. He reached over the table, took my hand, and laid a kiss on the back of it. Half now, I said firmly. He shook his head. You know I'm good for it. This job is important. I need to guarantee you'll finish it, no matter how it goes down. I didn't like his response, but he had all the power in our relationship. Fine, I huffed. Thank you. He gave another flirty smile as he looked up at me from my hand. I swear, he sniffed it. I snatched back my hand and cleared my throat. Well, then, I'll be in touch. Not so fast, Jinx. Here's a bag for you to put the vase in when you take it. It'll protect it. Promise me you'll do the job to the best of your abilities, and it'll use the bag. He held out a nondescript black padded bag. Wolf had the weird dial turned to maximum today. I rolled my eyes. I don't like giving promises. My word is my law. My mum had taught me that a promise was sacrosanct. Despite my misgivings, I agreed. I promise. I grabbed the bag and rose. There's nothing else. Wolf shook his head. Just be careful. And take your hound. This one is going to be tricky. You don't say. I picked up the file and made tracks. Time was ticking. Chapter 3 When I got home, I pored over the file that Wolf had given me. Conrad's house didn't really deserve that title. According to the old house sale particulars... It had seven bedrooms and had sold for in excess of two million pounds. The property was white-walled and castellated, definitely more of a mansion than a house. It sat on one acre of grounds and even had a heated outdoor pool. The driveway and the paths around the house were graveled. Gravel is a thief's nightmare. It crunches obnoxiously loudly as it shifts underfoot. When I'm in stealth mode, the slightest noise jacks up my heart rate, so gravel has it thundering. I hate gravel. 
Luckily, the paths were next to the lawned area, so I'd only have to cross a small section. Helpfully, the property had direct access to a towpath along the Thames. I could swerve the long gravel driveway and approach by boat instead. I prayed I wouldn't need a quick getaway. That could be my excuse, too, if I were found. Gatto and I, out for an evening boat ride to enjoy the solstice. I decided to dress in jeans and a t-shirt. Head to toe black wasn't going to help me because I planned to be away before darkness descended. I made a few calls, and before I knew it, I had a boat borrowed from a friend of a friend. I used the word friend loosely. Perhaps associate would be better. An unsavory associate. The file Wilf had given me contained a floor plan. The living room was circled emphatically, and I guess that was where Wilf thought the vase would be. Another room, marked as Bedroom 7, had a line through it, and Vault written on it. No prizes for guessing what was in there. I hoped that Wilf was right and the vase hadn't already been moved into the vault. I am a security expert, and as part of my job, I know a fair amount about safes. I can crack basic ones, but modern safes are above my pay grade. Luckily, this wasn't going to be a safe-cracking job. I didn't need to take my stethoscope or my drill. Wilf had made it clear that if the vase was in the vault, we were screwed, so I wasn't going to prep for that. This was a simple in-and-out job. The high price tag made me leery, but it should be simple enough, as long as I could avoid the eccentric, kick-ass owner. I cooked a large pack of sausages. Most people that keep dogs might say they use them as security, but they treat them like pets. Coming across properly trained guard dogs is rare. Most of them are usually diverted by a truly tasty treat, and a show of no fear on the part of an intruder. Some dogs are not so easily diverted, however. If those dogs came towards me, then Gatto would run next to me while we hightailed it out of there. I hadn't seen a single dog yet that would approach Gatto. With him stuck to me like glue, dogs wouldn't come close enough to become a threat. Gatto would stay out of the house on guard whilst I slipped in. He would make sure the exit didn't get covered by whatever guard animals this Conrad had. I showered once again. I didn't want to leave even a hint of my perfume in the house. Chanel is a fab brand because the smell really lasts, but that's not what I needed right now. I cleaned my body with an odorless soap. Gatto and I both ate a light dinner. I didn't want to be hungry or sluggishly full. I could feel the energy and nerve starting to zing through me in anticipation of the job to come. I grabbed the cooked, cooled sausages and put them in a Ziploc baggie. Then I put that in the black padded bag that Wilf had given me. I put on my trusty bum bag, which contains an assortment of helpful things, including my old skydiving weights and my lockpicks. If I was followed when I was on the boat, the bum bag would go overboard and sink to the bottom of the Thames. Hopefully, my pursuer would focus more on following me than diving into the river's murky depths searching for evidence. Later, the force of the Thames would push the bag down its winding path. Who knew where it would end up? Well, that was a plan, anyway. I like having plans even if I sometimes have to chuck them out the window. I drove to a commercial property near Windsor. It looked largely unused, a front for someone. I was met by a man who introduced himself as John. He pointed to a basic motorboat, which also had oars stowed as per my request. He raised an eyebrow at Gatto, but didn't say anything, and handed me the key to the boat's engine. The boat was already in the water. I climbed in, and Gatto followed, immediately sitting down in the bow of the boat, whilst I took the stern end. He'd been in a boat before, and he didn't like the motion, but if he stayed still, he was good. I put the bag at my feet, untied and coiled the rope, and started the engine. I was relieved when it instantly came to life. I nodded to laconic John, who watched, expressionless, as we moved out. I'd allowed up to forty minutes to reach our destination by water, Fortunately, my boat moved faster than I had hoped. I placed a pin on Google Maps to mark the location of the target. As we zoomed down the Thames, I checked to see how close we were. Within twenty minutes, we were nearly there. When the house was in view, I'd kill the engine and approach quietly. It was a warm summer night, and a lot of people were out in their gardens. As we reached a more exclusive area, their number petered out. The Thames had been well-travelled today, kicking up silt and making the waters dark. I really hoped I wouldn't end up going for a swim. As the blue dot on my map said we were nearing Conrad's house, I slowed the engine before turning it off completely. 
I set the oars into the oar locks and started to row. It was only a few minutes before I pulled us up to the house that I thought was the target. It would be embarrassing if I got it wrong. Wilf had given me a photo of the front of the house, but I was approaching from the rear. The foliage obscured the view from the river. The rich liked their privacy, but I was ninety percent sure I'd arrived at the right house. My arms were pleasantly warm from rowing, and I could feel the adrenaline flowing through me. It was go time now. No going back. I moored the boat by the jetty, and Gatto leapt out instantly, much happier on land. He gave me a reproachful look, but stayed quiet. He knew we were on a mission. I double-checked my knot was secure, then hopped off the boat. I had Wilf's black bag over my shoulder. I opened my bum bag and pulled out a pair of black, disposable gloves. If I was caught with them, I'd say I had a phobia about picking up Gatto's poop. It was a viable explanation, albeit a weak one. Gloved up, I zipped up the bum bag and started forward. The towpath was fairly overgrown, so I picked my way through it, feeling confident we wouldn't be seen. Up ahead was a white stone archway which led into the main garden, the only break in the stone wall that I could see. We made our way forward quietly, and I peered in through the archway. I could see the pool. It was a decent size, perhaps not quite Olympic size, but it was for someone who was serious about his swimming. A man, presumably Conrad, the apparently deadly owner, was lounging on the grass next to it. He didn't look all that deadly to me, but I'm a prime example of how looks can be deceiving. Gatto let out a low, rumbling growl from behind me. He grabbed the loop of my jeans in his mouth and pulled me back firmly. I stumbled backwards, barely retaining my footing. What the hell? What was going on? I turned to face him. He reared up onto his hind legs and touched his cold nose to my forehead, then he jumped back down. A rush of dizziness hit me, and my head started to buzz. I blinked my eyes and rubbed at them, but it didn't change what I was seeing. And what I was seeing was freaking impossible. Chapter 4 Gatto was watching me with cautious eyes. I stumbled back from him a little, my own eyes wide in shock. He didn't like my reaction, and he let out a little whine. But who could blame me? My beautiful black Great Dane now had large black spikes running the length of him protruding from his body. The spikes looked hard, shiny and lethal, like they were made from obsidian. I gaped as I stared at my pup. He let out another low whine and wagged his tail firmly, as if he wanted to tell me he was still the same dog. But he wasn't. I wasn't even sure that he was a dog. I lifted my eyes from him and I froze again in disbelief. The sky, the beautiful blue sky, was lilac, and not in a nice sunrise way. It was still over an hour from sunset, but it was purple, like I'd seen it briefly earlier on today. I consider myself pretty unflappable, but I was struggling to hold it together as I looked around me. The grass was turquoise, and the trees were virtually black. What? The... Heck. I'd gone through the wardrobe doors and now I was in freaking Narnia. What did you do? I hissed at Gatto. Where are we? He stopped wagging and let out another soft whine. He was still trying to be quiet and that reminded me of our purpose. We were here to retrieve a vase. I'd made a promise to Wilf that I'd get it and my word is important to me. For a number of years it's been all I have. I'd promised to do the job to the best of my abilities I doubted Wilf would accept my suddenly having a mental breakdown as an excuse for failing. Okay, so the world might have been painted with a different palette, but the job still needed to be done. I'd freak out later. And I would. Thoroughly. I needed to regain my equilibrium. I took a moment to do a quick calming visualization my mum had taught me. As a psychologist, she'd been all about mindfulness and meditation. After her death, I'd also learned about compartmentalization. I grabbed this particular problem and pushed it into a mental box, together with the other mental baggage like discovering my parents' mauled bodies. I turned back to my... Dog didn't seem like the right word. I remembered Wilf calling him my hound. Yes, hound fitted a little better. Then I frowned. What did Wilf know? Did he know about the different sky? 
I felt like I'd stumbled through a portal, like in Stargate. Gatto was still watching me anxiously, his tail now firmly between his legs. His whole posture read unhappy. Oh, stop that, I muttered to him. I don't judge a book by its cover, and I don't plan on starting now. I reached out and tried to stroke a section of his body that wasn't covered in deadly spikes. He let out a happy noise. As I reached out to stroke him again, he moved his spiked head so it was in the way. Cautiously, so cautiously, I gave his spiked head a pat. The spikes flattened under my hand, and his fur felt as soft as ever. As I stroked down his spine, I watched as spikes lay flat in front of my hand. Cool, I said with a smile. No spiking mummy, huh? We'll talk about this later. Now, let's go. I slipped forward on light feet. Peering through the archway again, I froze once more. I rubbed my eyes. Nope, it didn't help. There was still a huge blue and silver dragon lying by the pool. When I looked before, a man was lying there, but now there was an actual dragon. He was lounging casually, blowing smoke rings which occasionally crackled with fire. I pulled back from the archway. There's a dragon, I said calmly to Gatto. I hoped that saying it aloud might make it seem less insane, but it didn't. Gatto's tongue lolled out in a cheeky grin. He knew there was a dragon. Wasn't news to him. Thing is, my whole life I've been different. I am a walking, talking lie detector. I've always assumed that I'm not the only oddity in the world. It just doesn't make sense that I'm a one-off genetic mutation that hasn't been repeated anywhere else in the world. I've always expected to find others like me, or people who could do telekinesis or telepathy or something. I refuse to accept that I'm a freak. I've never quite fit in, and I've always wanted to. I've always wanted to be part of something bigger than me. Perhaps this was it. Maybe I wasn't prepared to see a dragon, but... Instead of fear, I was feeling a glimmer of something else. Excitement. I wasn't the only different one. If I wasn't insane, if I wasn't having a stroke right at that moment, then maybe this was it. Finally, I had found the place where I belonged. Besides, I'd given my word to Wilf and sworn I would give this job my best efforts. If I didn't, then tomorrow the vase would be in the vault and beyond Wilf's reach forever. Wait a minute. I reviewed my conversation with Wilf. Not once had he referred to the owner as a man. In fact, he'd called Conrad Draconian. Scumbag. Wilf knew he was a dragon. He damn well knew and he sent me in blind. And I bet Wilf knew why the sky was changing colour too. I was going to rip him a new one when this was over, and he was going to pay me quadruple. And then he was going to explain what the hell was going on. I blew out a breath. Wilf setting me in blind had given me a real moment of rage, and I was sorely tempted to turn around and leave. He should have been straight with me. Granted, if he told me the owner was a dragon, I would have just assumed he was being weirder than normal. I sighed. I'd given Wilf my word. Damn him. That meant I was going to try and steal from a dragon, and not even a sleeping one at that. But the hobbits managed it. How hard could it be? Thanks to Gatto, I now knew what I faced. My plan was simple. Avoid the dragon. The simple plans are the best ones. Through the archway I could see that the dragon was about twenty feet long, judging by his size next to the pool. His scales glittered like silver and sapphires, and he shone in the evening light. He lay on his back so I couldn't see his wings very clearly, though I could tell they were there. I had to assume he could fly. I could do this. Nobody in their right mind would steal from a dragon, so he wouldn't be expecting it. No wonder he didn't bother with an alarm system. You stay here, I ordered Gatto. Gatto looked at me and shook his head. Willful disobedience. I didn't have time to argue. The clock was ticking, and the sun was dropping. Fine, but we'll talk about this later, I reiterated. I decided to take the long way to the house, furthest away from the pool. Luckily, the gardens were manicured, and there were plenty of bushes and statues to hide behind, as we darted over the lawn. My heart was in my throat. This was the most scared and excited I had ever been. With most retrievals, there's the threat of arrest, perhaps even jail time. But I have the gift of the gab, and I've taught myself out of worse situations. 
With this one, though, I was pretty sure that the threat was death by dragon, either by chomping jaws or flaming breath. No thanks. But the adrenaline was helping me, and we made it across the first lawn with no problems. I crept delicately along the gravel path on the balls of my feet, and Gatto took similar care to make no sound. We started toward the second lawn, which, oddly, seemed to have three horses on, parents and a foal, perhaps. They swung their heads in our direction, and I swallowed a gasp. They were unicorns. Unicorns with horns on their heads, and red eyes. Wait. Red eyes. Without moving, without even breathing, I examined them. Their horns were long and silver. Their legs didn't end in forelocks and hooves, but in reptilian skin and huge claws, like the claws of a huge chicken, or, more accurately, like a T-Rex. Bile rose in my throat. They could kill you with those claws. I guess these were Conrad's guard animals. Son of a bitch. Gatto nudged the bag on my back. I slung it off my shoulder, opened it, and looked dubiously at the sausages inside it. Somehow I doubted they were going to work. Unfortunately, the Ziploc bag had come unfastened, and a little of the meat fat had spilled into the bag. Gatto nudged his great head into the bag and drew his head out, his mouth full of sausages. This isn't a great time for a snack, I whispered. He let out a small nasal huff, glared at me, and then he started to grow. He grew and grew until he stood as tall as a small horse. His head now bore three sharp spikes, and his caramel eyes were blood red, like the unicorns. I swallowed hard and repeated to myself that I did not judge a book by its cover. Gatto started to trot forward in front of the unicorns. They stiffened when they saw him, but remained stationary. He was smaller than them, but not by much. He moved past them, forcing them to turn their backs on me. Then, he carefully laid down the sausages. The unicorns started forward. It seemed that unicorns are meat-eaters. They started to jostle for the sausages. Now, or never. I ran as quickly as I could to the back door. I was screwed if it was locked, because I wouldn't have time to pick it before the unicorns turned around. Open, I whispered pleadingly as I tried the handle. At that moment, I felt a rush of foreign energy like nothing I'd experienced before. I didn't have time to work out what was going on. The door was unlocked, so I flung myself inside and closed it silently behind me. I hoped the dragon didn't have cameras inside because I desperately didn't want to be seen. I closed my eyes. No one will see me, I wished, hopefully. There was another rush of energy, but this time it was followed by a tug of tiredness. What was wrong with me? I opened my eyes and looked down at myself. I was still here, still visible, but my heart was hammering in my chest, and I felt on edge in a way I'd never felt before. Maybe it was the whole life and death thing. I looked around. I was in a kitchen. Sleek, modern, and utilitarian, like a service kitchen. I wondered if the dragon employed a chef. Strike that, I wondered what dragons eat. Please, let it not be humans. I made an executive decision not to look in the freezer. I shimmied out of the kitchen and crept into the hallway. All was silent. The decor was overdone. There were framed pictures and photos on every inch of the wall. Seeing a photo of the dragon with Marilyn Monroe, I took a moment to gape before giving myself a stern talking to. I focused on moving forward. There were small tables jutting out here and there, overloaded with stuff, letter openers, leather-bound books, trinkets, vases. Wolf hadn't been kidding. This guy collected anything and everything. No wonder Wolf thought he wouldn't notice a missing vase. I crept forward, careful not to jostle the laden tables. I'd memorized the floor plan, so I knew the living room should be the third room on my left. I opened the door, and my mouth dropped again. If I thought the hallway was cluttered, it had nothing on the living room. The decor here was sympathetic to the age of the building, all deep coving and wall carvings and ornate ceiling roses, but there was a huge amount of gold leaf that looked gaudy and tasteless, and the room literally overflowed with stuff. On an ornate sofa was a pile of gems, like something out of Aladdin's cave. Who could live like this? It was like the TV show Hoarders, but on a rich person's alternative universe. 
I searched desperately for the vase I was looking for, but there were at least forty or fifty vases, and it felt like, where's Wally? I realized abruptly that the light in the room was diminishing. The sun was starting to go down. How long had I been standing there? Galvanized into action, I stepped forward and started to move things to try and locate the one vase I was looking for. I let out a small, triumphant, aha, when I saw it. It was definitely the right one. It had the two fishes on the front, and a pale yellow neck. I put it carefully in the bag, closed it, and headed back the way I'd come. The sun was dropping fast now, and I needed to get out, pronto. I broke into a jog and ran down the corridor. In my haste, I jostled one of the tables, and a figurine of a lady fell to the floor and smashed. The noise was startlingly loud in the quiet house. I hastily pushed the broken pieces under the table. Then... I froze as I looked up. Amongst the photos of the blue and silver dragon with various famous people was a photo of my parents. My parents and a red and gold dragon. An older man I didn't recognize was astride it. My parents were beaming and looking at them affectionately. They had three triangles drawn on their heads like a crazy tattoo. I was sure my parents hadn't had any tattoos, yet this was definitely them. What were they doing with a dragon and a dragon rider? A thought occurred to me, and my stomach dropped. Their deaths had purportedly been caused by a home invasion that had gone wrong, but there were no clues, no fibres, no fingerprints, nothing. It was as if their killer had vanished into thin air. I stared hard at the huge red dragon. Maybe it had flown away. Maybe their killer had been something otherworldly with claws. My heart was racing, and I was certain I was right. After all this time, a clue. I took out my phone and took a picture of the photo. The affection between my parents and this dragon and its rider was clear, and somehow I doubted that this dragon had been their killer. But there were bound to be lots of other dragons. I'd seen photos of a red one and a blue one. Probably there was a whole rainbow of dragons out there. Time was not on my side, and I needed to get moving. I needed to stay focused, even though that now felt impossible. I paused at the kitchen door and looked back with longing at the picture of my parents on the wall. It took everything in me to leave them there. I pushed through the door into the kitchen. It was still empty. I opened the back door cautiously. The unicorns were milling around near the door. I'm not famed for my bowling, but I didn't have too many options. I opened the bag and threw the remaining sausages to the side of the unicorns. Obviously, as a breed, they're not particularly smart, because they didn't look to see where the treats had come from. I ran quickly to the statue beyond them and waited for Gatto to join me. He swung his large head around, looking for me. I whistled him, as softly as I could. His head snapped toward the statue and he started towards me. As he arrived, he sniffed the ground until he found me by my scent. Pup, I breathed softly. He tilted his head, still looking around for me. I didn't know how it was possible, but I seemed to be invisible. However, there was a dragon stretched out on the lawn, so maybe I needed to reevaluate my definition of what was possible. What had I done, and how did I undo it? I didn't want to be invisible forever. There was no time to think about it now. I'd have to trust Gatto to follow me, even though he couldn't see me. Come on, I whispered. We've got to go. Gatto wagged his tail once and transformed to stealth mode Gatto, which is to say he was still a huge black dog with spikes down his back, but now the spikes from his head were gone and his eyes were brown again. He looked more like the fur baby I knew and loved. We crept past the azure dragon. He wasn't lazing around the pool anymore. He was standing on his hind legs, silver wings unfurled, as he trumpeted at the waning sun. The noise sounded quite cheerful, and I took advantage of it to cross the stretch of gravel. My heart was pounding, and I was pleading with any god who would listen for the dragon to remain occupied for a little while longer. Gatto and I stumbled through the undergrowth and back to the borrowed boat. I climbed in and grabbed the oars. Gatto climbed in and sat down, still searching for me, though his gaze was fixed on the oars. I'm here, I reassured him. I untied the rope that secured us and pushed off from the jetty with one of my oars. As I started to row, I panicked about my invisibility. 
If someone saw this boat being rowed with no one in it, there were going to be questions. And they might try to take Gatto. I needed to be visible. See me. I pleaded with Gatto. I felt a rush of energy, then Gatto leapt forward and licked me enthusiastically as I became visible once more. Calm down, boy, I begged. Settle down, you're jostling the boat. He sat back down obediently, wagging his tail happily. I'm pleased you can see me too. What the hell is going on? What am I? I half expected him to respond. I must be able to do some kind of magic. Magic, Gatto. Much to my disappointment, he didn't respond, so I knuckled down and continued to row. Now wasn't the time, and I wanted a little more distance between me and the house. I was just about far enough away to start the engine, when I heard a terrifying roar. A dragon-like roar. Not a happy roar. Oh, man. I rowed hastily towards a neighbouring house with a huge weeping willow next to the riverbank. I pulled the boat under the cover of its branches and wished with all my might that I hadn't cancelled my invisibility quite so hastily. No sooner were we hidden than I heard the sound of great wings beating. I listened carefully as the noise got quieter and quieter. My heart was pounding. I had no desire to be dragon fodder. After waiting a good ten minutes in tense silence, I decided it was time to venture out. I peeled off the black gloves and stowed them in my bum bag and turned on the motor. The dragon had gone, and so had the need for silence. Speed was our friend now. We were only about five minutes from our destination when we saw a marine support unit boat coming towards us, manned by two officers. One was busy on his phone, and the other was steering. It slowed and drew alongside. You okay, ma'am? the second officer asked politely. His tone was perfectly level, but nevertheless, I felt his suspicion. Perhaps I was being paranoid. The officer's eyes skimmed over Gatto. No alarm fired in them. I didn't understand how, but Gatto's spikes weren't visible to him. I smiled easily. I'm fine, thanks, officer. Just took me an embarrassingly long time to work out how to make Bolter's lock work. I'm not far from my destination. Next time, I'm definitely letting my boyfriend come with me. I told him I'd be fine with my dog here, but locks are so much trickier on your own. Took me ages. The officer smiled. They do take some getting used to when you're solo, he agreed. Have you far to go? It's just two minutes down this way. He nodded. Have you seen many other boats on the river? I shook my head. Well, it's being pretty quiet. Okay, take it easy. He gave me a friendly wave as he thrust his boat into drive. I blew out a breath. He'd remember me, but couldn't be helped. Chapter 5 Taciturn John was still there when we returned to our dock. I threw the rope to him and he pulled us in and tied up the boat. I killed the engine and handed him the key, then climbed ashore. Gatto pranced behind me, happy to be on land again. I unlocked my car and we got in. Safely behind the steering wheel, I took a moment to take a full breath and regroup. I pulled down the visor to check my appearance after my adventure and gasped as I saw a tattoo on my head. There was a triangle in the middle of my forehead, just like the ones my parents had, except they'd had three, the increase in size. What the hell? I exclaimed. I rubbed at it. It wasn't sore, and it wasn't coming off. I glared at Gatto in the back seat. There's a triangle where your muzzle touched me. You've tattooed me. You better have a good explanation for this, pup. The police officer hadn't looked at me weird or stared at my forehead. The triangle mustn't have been visible to him. But I didn't get why not or how Gatto had made the mark appear. Gatto was mute. He met my eyes for a minute, then he rooted around under the passenger seat and pulled out my handbag. He nosed up my purse, flipped it open and gave it a shake. Hey, I objected. Gatto ignored me and kept thrashing his head. Money, business cards, and stamps came flying out. He leaned forward, picked out one of the business cards, and held it out to me with his teeth. The card was plain on one side, and the other side simply had the name Leo, and a telephone number. I couldn't for the life of me remember where it came from. I wanted to call the number, but first, I needed to get out of there. I could see John frowning at my car. He wanted me gone, and I couldn't blame him. Gatto let out a whine as we moved off. I'll call in a minute, 
I promised. Let's go somewhere safer first. My dog settled down, and we drove for five minutes before I decided to pull into a lay-by. I dug my phone out of my pocket and rang the number. Hello, Jinx, a voice answered. I've been expecting your call. I blinked. I hated this. Hated not knowing. What the hell is going on? Who are you, and why does my dog want me to call you? That was a sentence I never thought I'd say. Leo's voice was calm and even. You've discovered the other realm. I looked after Gatto for your parents until you were ready to have him. There were so many things to unpack in that, but the most pressing was, you knew my parents. Everything else fell away. Realms and magic, yeah, whatever. What did Leo know about my parents? Could he give me some answers about their deaths? Perhaps their murders weren't unsolvable in this place where magic existed. Yes, I knew your parents. I'll be at your home in an hour. Leo rang off before I could ask any more questions. I glared at the phone. Well, he's rude. And what if I'm not home in an hour, Mr. High and Mighty? I started the car again. We were closer to Wolf's place than my home, so I'd do the drop-off first. Then I'd meet Leo. And get some answers. Or perhaps just more questions. My heart constricted painfully. It was nearing eleven by now, so I dropped off the bag at the usual place under a bush by the back doorstep. Wolf preferred no contact for the drop-offs. He reveled in the cloak and dagger drama of it all. After the drop-off, I headed home. I had half an hour to spare before Leo arrived. As I turned on the lights in the lounge, I froze. The pictures of my parents had been transformed, and in all of them they had the three triangles on their foreheads. In one, my mother was next to a red dragon. I was pretty sure it was the same dragon I'd seen in the photo at the mansion, though... I was no expert. Now that I wasn't terrified for my life, I let myself think. The pictures evoked a million more questions. My parents had been involved in something, something magical. Had they been like me? They'd never once indicated that they had my truth-telling abilities. If they were magical, why had they never said anything? Why had they not told me about my skills as I was growing up? Why hadn't I been raised with others of my kind? What was I? I was feeling edgy, but also very tired, in a way I'd never felt before. My head was buzzing with unanswered questions, and my grief at losing my parents was resurfacing. I would never get any answers from them. I would never get to ask them what was going on, or why they had raised me as they had. I was pacing, restless for answers even though I was emotionally drained. I texted Wilf to say that I'd delivered the vase. He called me immediately. His opening line was, Jinx, why does my priceless vase have sausage fat on it? Oops, I countered. Wolf, why did you not mention the homeowner was a dragon? I knew it, Wolf crowed. I knew you were other. You threw me off at Rosie's because you didn't even look at the portal, and Roscoe said he'd never seen you there before. But you have your very own hellhound. Wolf, I said tightly, I have no idea what's going on. One minute I was breaking into a house... A normal house, then Gatto touches his nose to my head and the sky is purple and the grass is turquoise and there's a massive dragon on the lawn. What is other? What am I? There was a long beat of silence. When Wilf spoke, he sounded stunned. You haven't been introduced? I sighed irritably. Wilf, I have absolutely no idea what you're talking about. He said abruptly, There's another realm. We call it the other. We call the normal world the common. The other is full of all things magical. Like terrifying unicorns. Ah. <clears throat> yes. Them. Wolf coughed uncomfortably. What are you? I asked slowly. I didn't care if it was rude. I was in shock and I was entitled to a rude question or two. I'm a werewolf. He said it like someone else might admit to being a teacher or a dentist, like it was no big deal. Of course you are, I said calmly. And me? What am I? I don't know, Wolf admitted. You smelled off. I just knew you were other. I smelled off, I objected. All right, my outrage about that particular comment was a little contrived, because I had other things to worry about at that moment. I made myself invisible, 
I confessed. Ah, you're a wizard then. Use the intention and release. The IR. The IR. I R. Wizard's magic, it's not something I'm familiar with, but I understand that if you wish for something very hard, then use a word or phrase to release the wish. Bingo. The thing is done. I sat down heavily. No Latin and wand-waving, huh? This is nuts. You're a werewolf. I'm a wizard. Next, you'll be telling me there's vampires, ghosts, and ghouls. Vampires and ghouls, yes. Ghosts, no. At least not as far as we know. Vampires, I repeated dully. Sure. The thing is, I'd known my whole life I was something else. A walking, talking human lie detector, so... It wasn't as shocking as it should have been that there were other oddities. In a way, it was reassuring. Suddenly, I wasn't alone, and there might even be a place where I could fit in. Why didn't you talk to me about any of this before? If you thought I was other, why didn't you ask me? We're forbidden to talk about it. Our government, the Connection, enacted the verdict. The verdict is a binding gesh. Essentially, we can only talk about the other to those who know about the other. There are strict rules about introductions and who can carry them out. I've never seen you with the other triangle, so I couldn't be sure you knew. And if I'm not sure, I can't talk about it. Listen, this is too much for a phone call, Wolf said abruptly. I'm coming over. He hung up before I could protest. With Leo and Wolf arriving, I could have a party. The doorbell rang barely five minutes later. It was too quick for Wolf to get here unless werewolves could fly or had a crazy super speed, so it must be Leo. Though anything was possible. Gatto wagged his tail happily. I went to the door and opened it. The man on my front doorstep had two triangles on his forehead. The inner one was the same size as mine, and then he had a much larger triangle around it. The second middle triangle that my parents had was missing. That was the first thing I noticed. The second thing was that he had pointy ears, like an elf. The third thing was that he was old, like, really old. His wrinkles had wrinkles, and he was stooped with age. I was surprised his heart was still beating, although maybe it wasn't. I had no idea what he was. I realized I didn't know what vampires looked like. Maybe it would be best not to invite Leo in, just in case. He smiled at me. Hello, Jinx. How young you look. I gave him a bit of a weird smile back. What was I supposed to say to that? I was as old as I've ever been. He looked beyond me to Gatto. Hello, Isaac, dear friend. You look well. My dog came and leaned against the old man, who patted him affectionately. You look like your mother, Leo said abruptly, examining me closely. You knew her. I knew her very well, until you found her body, he agreed. It was the opening I needed. It wasn't a home invasion gone wrong, was it? I asked. But I already knew the answer. Mum and Dad's bodies had been torn to pieces, stabbed, ripped to shreds in a way that had shocked even the hardest of police officers. No, Leo agreed. It wasn't a home invasion. It was an assassination. True. My God. A lead. An honest-to-goodness lead. After five years, I had a line to tug. I was going to find this red dragon who'd been their friend. Surely it would help me. Why? I asked desperately. Why were they killed? I'm sorry, Leo said softly. He looked at Gatto. You know this is too early, he said reproachfully. Don't do it again. She needs to be introduced properly, not portled in willy-nilly while she's by herself. Gatto's tail went between his legs, and he whined pathetically. Leo turned to me and smiled. Until next time, Jessica Sharp. He held his hand out in front of himself, in front of me, and I felt power whipping round us both. Wait, what are you doing? I asked in alarm. My gut was screaming at me, and Gatto was crying. Clear, Leo intoned. There was a flash of light. Chapter 6 I blinked several times to clear my eyes. Gatto was whining and standing next to an old man. I didn't remember opening the front door. My head felt fuzzy and confused. Come here, boy, I called him. Gatto came straight away. He was trembling and I didn't stop stroking and cuddling until he stopped. 
It's okay, I reassured him, though. I frowned as I realized I couldn't quite recall why he was upset. It had been a long night. The doorbell must have startled him, the old man offered. Lie. Yes, I agreed. I guess so. I frowned at him. I'm sorry, can I help you? Why did you come by? I just wondered if I could borrow some sugar. True. I blinked. Yes, sure. Hold on. I gently moved Gatto back inside with me and shut the door on the old man's face. A little rude, I know, but I felt defensive and uncertain, and I didn't know why. My gut wasn't happy with the old man, even though I couldn't imagine why. He was ninety, if not older. He wasn't a threat. There was no chance he could harm me. I grabbed a small Tupperware pot, filled it with caster sugar, and returned to the front door with Gatto on my heels. Gatto was upset. Clingy, that just wasn't like him. I opened the door and held out the pot. Here you go, I offered, thrusting it towards him. He took it with a grateful smile. Thank you, young lady. I'm sure we'll meet again. True. Weird. I shut the door and rubbed my eyes. I was shattered. I went upstairs to brush my teeth. I stared in the mirror at my forehead. I rubbed at it. Had I had a spot there? It felt like something was missing. I shrugged off the feeling I was about to change into PJs when there was another knock at my door. It was gone midnight. Who on earth could be knocking at this time? I opened the door and blinked in surprise to see Wilf there. I didn't even know he knew my address. What are you doing here? Didn't you get my message? I already dropped the vase off at your house. In and out, piece of cake. Thanks for the warning about the dogs. I've chucked them some sausages. Wilf was looking at me oddly. He shifted his gaze to Gatto, who, I swear, shook his head. Someone cleared her mind, Wolf said to my dog. He sounded sad. What an odd comment. I often clear my mind before bed, I said huffily. It's not an unusual occurrence. Meditation is important. I'm sorry you came all the way here for nothing, but as I said, I've already dropped the vase off. I frowned suddenly. I was going to ask for four times my fee. I trailed off because I couldn't remember why. It wasn't like me to try and change the terms after a job. Well, never mind, I muttered. It doesn't matter. Wolf swallowed hard. Four times seems fair. He scrubbed his hand through his blonde hair and looked at me again. Four times, he repeated. Are you okay? I asked impulsively. Wolf likes to think that we're friends, though I think of him as more of an acquaintance. But something was off with him tonight, and I wasn't boorish enough to ignore it. I'm a little upset, he said slowly. I was excited to help a friend learn something new, but now the opportunity is lost. True. They've learned it already? Something like that, he said vaguely. I'll send you the money. He turned to Gatto. Keep her safe, he ordered. He's a good guard dog. Are you concerned about the homeowner coming after me? I was both curious and a little alarmed. No, Wolf reassured me. Even if he realizes something has been taken, he'll be looking for the employer, not the employee. That's just how corporate sharks work. He opened the front door and turned back to me. Take care, Jinx. His words were heavy with warning, but I didn't know why. I gave him a vague finger wave and watched as he climbed into his Lamborghini. I shut the front door and fastened its many locks. As I walked back into the lounge, one of the photos of my mum caught my eye. It was one I'd seen a hundred times before, yet now it looked different. Mum was smiling in the picture, but she was off-centre. Quite a bit off-centre. Not quite sure why. I fished out my phone and looked at the camera reel. I'd taken a photo in the mansion. It was a picture of a photograph of three people and a horse. A man I didn't know was riding the horse. The people on the ground had their bodies turned away from the camera, their faces obscured. I frowned at the picture. Why on earth had I stopped to take a picture of a photograph? I shook my head, and my thumb hovered over the delete icon, but my gut was telling me that this photo was important, and I closed the phone without deleting it. Maybe I could find out something about this horse rider. My head was hammering. 
I scrubbed a hand over my grainy eyes. I was exhausted. This had been the longest day of my life, so long that it felt a bit blurry around the edges. Definitely time for bed. I got into my pyjamas and went to close the curtains in my bedroom. I paused. I had the funniest feeling that the sky was the wrong colour. I laughed out loud at myself. I was too tired to Google about brain tumours tonight. I climbed into bed and Gatto settled next to me. He seemed a little morose. I gave him a few extra cuddles to cheer him up. Sleep well, pup, I said. Everything will look better in the morning. I frowned. That was a phrase my mother used to use. Evidently, she was playing on my mind. Perhaps a meditation before sleep really was a good idea. I closed my eyes and imagined a beach and an ocean with great, crashing waves. I pictured a horse running along the sand, its forelock splashing playfully in the foam. My mind grew fuzzy. As I tumbled into sleep, I heard the horse roar. I dreamt of dragons. This has been Glimmer of Dragons, written by Heather G. Harris, narrated by Elise Gibbs, copyright 2021 by Heather G. Harris, production copyright by Heather G. Harris.